Guy, welcome to Cape Town. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> been a long haul. Yeah, it has been uh, one or two days longer than I planned, that's for sure. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. You can see behind us the boat has just been taken out of the water. And I think to everybody's amazement, even guys, couldn't believe how many barnacles, but we're going to get there in a minute. Guy, just um, give us a little bit of the history of leaving the Sable Belong and uh, sailing down to Cape Town, the ups and the lows, obviously a lot of lows with the, uh, yeah. with the slowness of the race and so on. But just give us a little bit of a feel of how you were during that time. Yeah, sure. Well, it, I mean, really, it's a story that goes back uh, at least two years before race time. Even. That's the, I think that's what, uh, I think if I could get one thing across to people, Norman, more than anything else is that it's not just the race itself it, it, that's the sort of like the, the cherry on the icing on the cake with with all of the work that goes into the into the project and uh, so it really you you've you've already uh, achieved a milestone just making the start line uh, it's, a, it's a it's a massive uh, challenge in many ways only 12 months before race start we had something like 30 entrants in the race but come September 4th on the, in the Sable Delon we were down to 16, yep. and by the time I'm now here in Cape Town, yeah. we're down to eight. Yep. I mean, you know, it, that's the that's, that's the scale exactly. of the challenge. It's the massive, challenge. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, in the in the 100 days it's taken me to get here, okay, which is uh, just just while we're on the subject, is about 40 days longer than I had planned in my in my grand scheme of how many days is it going to take around to get around the world and how much food and water do I need to bring with me etc etc so it's uh, I'm, I'm long overdue for this part of the world and uh, we had a, a difficult start because we had wind holes uh, I think there were three very light wind patches uh, to, to fight our way through in, in the Bay of Biscay it took us most of the fleet the best part of a week just to get just to escape Biscay and in the 2018 race I think they were done with Biscay in two two or three days max so we've had we've had some challenging weather right from the start yeah and uh, and then I first started to discover these uh, little friends of mine uh, somewhere around about Lanzarote uh, which was only only week three of the race or so three or four weeks into the race uh, they were starting to appear and uh, and then after the ITCZ, the, the doldrums, where you expect to be moving slowly because of the nature of the, the weather that you expect there, it, it didn't really dawn on me just how bad the situation was until the trades started to kick in, yep. uh, the southeast trades. So I'm now uh, I'm approaching the equator. I'm just leaving the ITCZ, the doldrums, and I've got the first taste of the trades. The boat heels and starts to sail. It just doesn't feel quite right. I'm thinking. It's What's wrong with my boat? And I look over the stern to check I'm not dragging a piece of old fishing net or rope or something yeah. behind the boat. There's nothing there. I then lean right over the side of the boat and I can see goose barnacles stuck to the hull of the boat right down by the water line. And that was the first indicator I had. That I and had that were they then as bad as what they are now or have they? No, they were. Well, some of them. Clearly, there's the, there are different stages of growth, you might say. I mean, some of those are, are getting to sort of this sort of length now, three and four inches long, or 7,500 millimeters, yeah. and some of them are tiny, as though they've only just as though they've only just joined the family, as it were. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and these were all small things, and I, because I just got that, that very first taste of the trade winds, having spent quite a bit of time. You know, drifting around from wind hall to wind hall in the ITCZ, I was really desperate to keep going. And in hindsight, if I could have, if I could change one thing right now, I would have stopped the boat right there and then, dropped the sails, gone in the water, and at least attempted to get rid of what barnacles were there to keep going. But I didn't because I got the taste of the trades. And I thought I need to keep up. I need to keep moving. And uh, and, and then three weeks of trade winds all the way down to Trindade and the boat was just getting slower and slower and every day I could hear people, uh, entrance, fellow entrants on the HF radio uh, giving their position of where they are and they're slowly getting further and further away from me. The few boats that were behind me were getting closer and closer and it was all just the, the house of cards was just starting to fall in on itself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because at a point you were actually going to go across to Punto, weren't you? Yes, I, well, I, this is the part of the, all part of the process, you might say, is you, di you discover this 
when you're literally hundreds if not thousands of miles from anywhere. And so you go through this highs and lows of, of, of what you're going to do or what can you do about it, etc, etc. And I, my, my instant thought, for whatever, whether it was good reason, good reason or bad, was to head to Punta del Este uh, and, and, and try to tackle the problem. And then I looked at the chart and very quickly realised that Punta del Este was miles away, thousands of miles away, and that actually Itajai in Brazil was a lot nearer. And so I started thinking, well, Itajai is probably, I've never been there before, but it, the Volvo Ocean Race stopped there a couple of times. They've probably got good facilities, the kind of facilities I need to tackle a problem like this, and I changed my plan for Itajai. And then in the coming days, you know, with a sort of the kind of emotional roller coaster I was on of highs and lows, and, you know, my place in the race and how it wasn't a race anymore, and the, the thought of going into Chichester class, etc., etc. I just said to myself, I really don't want to stop. I want to keep on going. And uh, and so I turned away from it to dry and planned to continue to Cape Town, right. and with the with the view of doing what Jeremy Bagshaw did, yep. and that's going to Simon's Town and like, picking up a boy there. And, going over the side and trying to scrape the numbers off. But as the days and weeks went by, Sagamata was just getting slower and slower and slower. And I was eating into food supplies that should have been saved for much later in the voyage. Yep. And it was it was all starting to, to sort of stack up against me. Yep. And, uh, and eventually I came to the reason that the, the, uh, the, the decision was the, the best thing for me uh, with, with the, the state of the boat and where I am with everything else, having been now so slow yes. and spent so much time at sea, was to stop here, address all those issues and get back in the water and continue with what for me is still 80% of the GGR is still left for the taking. Oh, well done. So, Fantastic. So yeah. you're in. So, we're, yeah, absolutely. We're, this is not the end of, of Sagamata and I and the GGR. We're, we're just a pit stop. Okay, brilliant. And you're hoping to be back in the water by when? Well, of course, I picked holiday weekend to arrive in Cape Town. Oh, uh, true. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, which wasn't part of the plan, but uh, they're telling me that I can have the boat back in the water on Monday. Yep. And so that gives me the weekend to clean, anti foul, uh, reprovision, etc. And then as soon as the boat's back in the water, if we've got the right weather window, then yes. away we go. Okay. We were chatting earlier about the name of the boat, and it's, yes. uh, and it's very interesting. Why don't you just run that through us again? The Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, the, actually, the boat was built for John Rock, the designer of the Trade 35, and he named it Betty. Uh, okay. And then the boat was bought by a, a couple who sailed her to um, Australia and New Zealand and renamed Silver Heels. And then the boat was sold by Don McIntyre when he first came up with the concept of the GGR because he was going to enter the GGR yep. in Silver Heels. Okay. He sold the boat then to Kevin Fairbrother. And Kevin has climbed Mount Everest three times. And the Nepali name for the Mount Everest region is Sagamata. There we go. Now, if I believe I'm correct in saying that uh, Nepalese is probably rooted in Sanskrit, the ancient Indian language. And Sagamata in Sanskrit means mother of the sea because the Himalaya region, when it melts, it melts into the Ganges and the Ganges flows into the Indian Ocean, so it's, it's giving birth to the sea. So Sagamata is the mother of the sea. So it's, for me, uh, it's a great name in, in, both, in both senses. So, so we kept the name and, and that's, yeah. the, that's, the, that's the origins of Sagamata. Ah, brilliant, love the story. Thank you. Love the story. I noticed the boat um, above the waterline is immaculate. It, there seems to be very little wrong with it. Yeah. Just, just run it through. Well, I mean. well, first of all, thank you for the compliment. Because yeah, I did most of the work myself, so I, I, I'll take that. Okay. Um, I had an interview with Don. You know, we have the satellite phone call interview uh, every week. And it was either either um, this Monday or the previous week. And he asked me, you know, what's the condition of the boat like, apart from the barnacles, you know, how is, how is everything? I said, everything is A1. Everything works. I don't have any electrical issues, no battery charging issues, no sail damage, no mast or rigging, no no steerage, no hydrovane, no you know, no problems anywhere. The boat is absolutely A1, good to go. It's just the problem it's the of the barnacles. And wow. it's just too big of a problem uh, at, the, at the stage of development that they're at now for me to just 
think that I can just dive under the boat and scrape them off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just, just now they were trying to push some of those barnacles off with the scraper standing on terra firma. And That's they right. Didn't do it. Yeah, they're didn't using do it. A, they're using a long handled scraper, That's something right. that resembles a garden hoe. And they're strong guys standing on terra firma, as you say, yeah. pushing them, and they're not exactly coming away. They're easily. not coming away. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the friendship tour. Why yes. you to expand a little on that, on that first piece, uh, guy? Yeah, they, well, the Friendship Tour were really, uh, they sort of saved the day for me. It was, uh, I was in the Savile de Lon, on the Vendée pontoon with all the other entrants, ready for the race. But in the back of my mind, I knew I did not have all the funding I needed to actually, to realistically sail away from the start line. Uh, without knowing that I was leaving some form of debt behind me. And uh, Friendship Tour came and saved the day, literally days before race time, they became a sponsor. And uh, Christophe and Sharon Leclerc, uh, a Frenchman and English one, uh, who are behind Friendship Tour, uh, they're, basically they're, they're trying to bring England and France back together because obviously as a result of Brexit, uh, the UK left the EU, but there's a lot of people in France and in England, who don't want to be separate from, from Europe, whether we're in the EU or not. They want to continue doing business and, and, uh, and, and, and the friendship that, we, that we've had together for years, and they want to see it continue. So that's the basis of Friendship Tour. And the nice part, for, actually for them, as a, as a result of me stopping here, is the, the overwhelming support that we've had through Facebook and social media, etc., from people all around the world, particularly people in, in South Africa, in Cape Town, mm -hmm. uh, who've rallied to, to come out and help me get the boat uh, safely into Cape Town, out of the water here to do the work. Uh, two of my friends that I've met through the clipper race, uh, Wavy Immelman and Nick Leggett, who were skippers uh, like myself in the last clip around the world race, uh, they've been here today to help me. And they're, they're helping me all weekend long, so uh, so it's a it's a happy story for all of us. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, any um, wishes you'd like to send to some of your friends, family, or oh, other yeah, sponsors, it's a, it's a or very, anything? Absolutely, it's a it's a very surreal world because um, you know you with with all of the social media and the and the, and the website and the interest etc. The, the race tracker particularly, you on land know more about where I am every minute of the day than I do you know for the whole race because I'm using a sextant which is fairly accurate you know but you know not as accurate as the tracker that's pinging away every every hour or whatever it's doing okay and and you've all got one another to bounce off and you you can listen to the satellite calls you can you can hear guy you know who's on his knees because everything you know everything's going wrong and you can talk to someone else who's you know on cloud nine because they're doing really well and having a great day and you've got all that comparison we don't have that we're we have a little bit of interaction with one another over the hf radio but uh but not the same level of of knowledge that you have so uh it's a it's a very it's a very strange world being out there on your own but although you're out there on your own the one thing i can say is that without, without all of these names of people and businesses etc on the side of the boat and without a great deal of help from the scarborough yacht club my home yacht club in, in, uh, in north yorkshire and friends and family and people who've donated i simply wouldn't have made it this far i wouldn't have even made it to the start so you know to to be here to be still in it to some extent and to be planning to continue on is, is all because of them and it's, it's the, probably the one way I can pay them back for their input. I'm so happy to hear that you're going to continue. Thank you. Um, I think you'll be the first person to drop into to, to, to class. Yes. But um, yeah, well done. And certainly from the GGI team. Thank you for continuing. It's awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Any other questions, Kyle? I think we've just about covered it all, Guy. We want to wish you the best of luck for Monday. We will see you on, on Monday, get Fantastic. the launch, we'll take the photographs, etc. Yep. etc. Et and then wish you well in the way. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Cheers. So we're signing